until the early 2000s. Where I come from in Victoria, they only repealed that law in 2002. So as a species, we're not always good at seeing change. My culture, the white Anglo-Saxon Christian culture, can be particularly bad at seeing change. We can be particularly bad at seeing change, particularly when it happens outside of our cultural context. For example, we called the years 400 to 1400 the Dark Ages because the world went backwards. The problem with that narrative is the world didn't go backwards, just my culture did, just the white Anglo-Saxon Christians did. And let me give you a couple of examples. What was the Roman numeral for zero? It's a trick question. There wasn't one. How can you have the decimal system if you don't have the number zero? And the answer is you can't. Yet in the, in the year 795, the fella on the top left-hand side, Al Khorazamu, in a little town called Kiva in what's now modern-day Uzbekistan, didn't invent zero but perfected its use and perfected algebra. Without his work in 795 in Uzbekistan down the old Silk Road, we wouldn't have the decimal system of counting. Yet we didn't recognise that and we don't read that in the history books in the white Anglo-Saxon culture because there was an advancement that happened outside of our culture that we didn't recognise because we didn't do it. Likewise, what did you learn in school about who discovered the world was round? Most people learned it was Galileo. Put your hands up if you learned it was Galileo who discovered the world was round, not flat. The problem with that narrative is 200 years before Galileo, this fellow on the right, Mirzo Ulugbek, in his observatory outside what's now Samarkand, again in Uzbekistan, discovered the world was round. But it didn't happen in my culture, so my culture didn't accept it, and my culture didn't put it in the history books. My culture is very bad at seeing change happening outside of its own culture. My culture now talks about China rising rather than returning because we also don't always have a great historical perspective. Many people in my culture will look at a graph like this and say, clearly the economy of China is rising from 1980, less than 5% of the global economy. It's going to take over the United States. It's going to be the largest economy in the world. The problem with that narrative is if you then extend your time frame, extend your history out a little bit, let's go back to Jesus Christ, you see something completely different. Back in the year 1000, 1500, China and India combined were more than 60, some people say more than 80% of the global economy. When you actually go back in time, you see that China has come down and China is not rising. China is returning. India is not rising. India is returning. Why is this narrative important? Why is it important to look at the words and understand actually what's going on? And what caused this? Because before 1500, individual productivity around the world was more or less the same. Before the Industrial Revolution, before the Scotsman invented his train, basically everyone in the world was a subsistence farmer. A few royals here and there, but basically the vast majority of people in the world were subsistence farmers. Individual productivity around the world was more or less the same, and in fact, your relative economic size and your relative population size as a country were in alignment. Your relative economic importance and your relative population importance were in alignment. But the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the steam train and all of these other things gave the white European Anglo-Saxons, an enormous productivity boost. They just got lucky they invented that stuff first. And what they did with this enormous productivity boost is the age of empire, the age of colonialism, and we saw 500 years of dominance, 500 years of creating global commerce, creating the logistics, trains and networks that we know today, and the culture of global trade was governed by those who ran it, which was the white Anglo-Saxon Christian tradition that governed global trade for 500 years. Now, why is China returning now? Why is India returning now? Because about 1950, more or less, we started the information age. And what did we do with the information age? 
We spread that knowledge about individual productivity. We removed the comparative advantage that the Europeans had in inventing the Industrial Revolution. From 1950 onwards, it's therefore not a question about knowledge of how to improve individual productivity, it's about implementation of that knowledge. So the world is returning to a position where your global population size and your global economic importance are coming back to alignment just as it always was before. And why is this important? I call this a once in a millennia historical rebalancing of the power of trade. We've done it before. We saw the Romans handing over, or the Greeks handing over to the Romans, the Romans to the Zoroastrians, the Zoroastrians to the Muslims, the Muslims to the different Khanates and empires up and down the Silk Road, for example. And here's something that we saw a lot of through these great transitions from Greeks to Romans to Romans to the Zoroastrians, Zoroastrians to Muslims to Muslims to the Industrial Revolution. And now as we transition through to an Asian dominance, something was consistent for all of these parts of the world, and that was trade. Trade went through cultures. Trade went through different religion, religious dominations. I call it the agnostic power of trade, the agnostic power of trade that's driven by good logistics. We've seen it before, and we've seen it again, and it's happening now. We are seeing this historical rebalance between one cultural dominance and another cultural dominance based on information and individual productivity coming back into alignment. A global rebalancing between economic influence and population. And this is why the current return of China and the return of India is not just about one economy growing strong, one economy returning, it's a cultural global rebalance. The changing culture of global trade is unfolding before our eyes today. But what will be the future culture of trade? What will it mean? What will it mean for the work that you do? What will it mean for purpose, profit and heart? Now, some of you would have heard of China's One Belt, One Road policy and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I'm going to overgeneralize it now. One Belt, One Road. President Xi stood up in 2013 and he announced a multi-trillion dollar physical infrastructure investment program to link the belt of former Silk Road countries and a, a seaborne road linking sub-Saharan Africa through South Asia into China. The Europeans, bless their soul, often demonstrate it as in the top left picture. The Europeans, being European-centric, think this is all about connecting Europe with China and they get all excited when a new train line goes from Beijing to London. Forgetting completely the new train line that goes from Beijing to Afghanistan, com forgetting completely the train line that's about to open from Shanghai to Karachi, the new port that's already been opened in Karachi, the new port that's been opened in Djibouti, the new air link that links Kashgar and Islamabad. In fact, the top left picture is not that accurate in showing what's actually being connected, what is actually being connected, is this bottom left picture. But why am I getting so excited about sub-Saharan Africa? Third fastest growing economic region in the world. Five of the seven fastest growing economies over the last 15 years have been sub-Saharan Africa. Off a low base, but they're growing. Second fastest growing region of the world is South Asia, about to become the fastest growing region of the world, taking over from what is currently the fastest growing region, China, about to become the second fastest. In fact, one belt, one road is connecting the third fastest growing region with the second fastest growing region with the first fastest growing region, and none of it includes either the United States or, really, Europe. Because there's something fundamental changing. And to give you a good example about that is the top right picture. Just two weeks ago, the new Mombasa to Nairobi train line opened. Pretty excited about that. New logistics chains and opportunities for you. But guess what's next on the list is building it from Nairobi through Kampala, one branch to Kigali and one branch to Kisangani. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kisangani, but Kisangani really is a 
It's not the world's most livable city, let me put it that way, in the middle of jungle in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But the other important thing about Kisangani is there is a single line, narrow gauge railway that runs from Kisangani to Kinshasa. In other words, you run into Kisangani, you've now connected Mombasa to Kinshasa. You've connected east-west across the African continent. It's astonishing, and this is being built now, and because it's not being built by the European cultures, Britain, the United States, France, Germany, we don't really get excited about it. It doesn't hit the headlines in the newspapers in the way that we should, because we are fundamentally changing the power dynamics of global trade by bringing Sub-Saharan Africa together with South Asia, together with China. And then RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So the Americans stood up, bless their soul, with Trans-Pacific Partnership, and if I overgeneralize, Trans-Pacific Partnership was a uh, US-led free trade agreement through the Asia Pacific, but ignoring China. And Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a China-led free trade agreement ignoring the United States. Indeed, in some ways, RCEP and TPP were China and America's way of saying, choose sides, who are you backing? Saying that to the Asia Pacific, to which the Europeans thought, Asia Pacific, oh, Tuvalu, Tokelau, Fiji, who cares? But the Europeans forget, actually, Asia Pacific is more than Tuvalu, Tokelau, and Fiji. It includes New Zealand, it includes Australia. Oh, then now they're starting to get interested. It includes Philippines, it includes Vietnam, it includes Japan and China. Oh, now they're getting interested. It includes Russia. How many people remember that Russia is a Pacific country? Vladivostok. And how many people remember the Pacific actually has two sides? So you flick across to the other side, Asia Pacific includes Canada, United States, Mexico, all of Central America, Peru, Chile. In fact, the Asia Pacific is so much more than Tuvalu, Tokelau and Fiji, it is 60% of global trade. Even the Chinese recognised they were going to lose round one to the United States. RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, was all about positioning for round two in 2025 and 2030. And then my fifth cousin, once removed Donald Trump, a true story, get me drunk and I'll tell you how, decided he was going to get rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and to be fair, so was Hillary Clinton. In one decision, the United States took the entire Asia Pacific, walked over to Beijing and said to President Xi, here, yours. You're now the leader. Between One Belt, One Road and RCEP, China is taking dominance of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Asia, Asia Pacific. Tell me why we don't know this, why it's not at the top of our minds. And how fast is this happening? President Xi announced this policy in 2013, only four years ago. Now, if the Australian Prime Minister announced an infrastructure investment in 2014, I'd wake up 2013, I'd wake up in 2020 to see if any of it had been done, and the answer is probably not. But the Chinese have actually done a lot of this already. This transition I'm talking about is not a 200-year transition. This transition I'm talking about is a 20-year transition, and we're 10 years through it already. What we're seeing, the change, leading in times of change, the change we are living through right now is the most fundamental time of human change since the fall of the Roman Empire. And we're living through it. And not only are we living through it, we, through the jobs we do, the education we have, the knowledge we have, we can influence it a little bit each day. We can make someone's health care a little bit better by understanding the logistics that's coming from this. The partnerships between so many of your companies that are helping economic growth and helping health and education outcomes in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, how much more are you going to be able to do it as this infrastructure investment unfolds, as this logistics network unfolds and you can use it. Phenomenally exciting. The future. How will the future look with One Belt, One Road fully implemented, with RCEP up and running? Even Singapore's, uh, Singapore's Prime Minister last week in a 
magnificent example of Singaporean understatement said the United States exit from the Trans-Pacific Partnership has hurt confidence in the US policy. Hurt confidence. Destroyed, blown up, I would use a whole bunch of other words. And now we're in this really super ironic position that communist China is the champion of global free trade and setting up a structure where they are going to dominate free trade economically, legally, and culturally. Some people would be scared by this. Some people will be full, full of hope for this. I'm ambivalent as to whether it's going to be positive or negative, but I'm excited that it's going to be. What's our role in it? How do we link profit, purpose, and heart to this agnostic power of trade? 